I want to share an article I read this past week. Former Dallas police officer Amber Geiger was sentenced Wednesday to 10 years in prison for killing 26-year-old um, Botham Jean in his apartment. At the sentencing phase, Jean's younger brother told her, I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that Botham would want for you. He added, I love you as a person and I don't wish anything bad on you. He then asked the court for permission to hug her. The image of the two embracing made national headlines. The prosecutor said that in 37 years of practicing law, I never saw anything like that. Brent Jean was right about his older brother's character and his faith. Both of them, Jean was born in St. Lucia, an island in the Eastern Caribbean. He became a Christian at an early age and began preaching as a teenager. He sang in his church choir in St. Lucia, in college in at Dallas West Church of Christ, where he led the congregation of worship the Sunday before he was killed. CNN reports that after Brant Jean's remarkable act of grace, District Judge Tammy Kemp gave Geiger a Bible and also hugged her. You can, you can have mine. I have three or four more at home, the judge said. This is the one I use every day. This is your job for the next month. It says right here, John 3, 16. And this is where you start for God so love the world. Clearly, neither Brant Jean nor Judge Kemp intended to minimize the horrific pain that was caused by Geiger's actions. Rather, we should see their gracious acts as personification of the, of the gospel's transformative power. When we know we have been forgiven, we are more empowered to forgive others. We want to give what we have received to pay forward the grace that has changed us. And if you've kept up with the news, you know what that was all about when the uh, police officer in Dallas thought she was in her own apartment and was in someone else's and shot and killed them, thinking they were an intruder. And if you heard that on the uh, news the other night, as the brother of the man who was killed embraced uh, the police officer to say, I have forgiven you. I want nothing bad to happen to you. In fact, he said even in the presence of his own family, if it were up to me, I would not want you to even have to serve a day. What kind of person does it take to have such great forgiveness in their heart? Many of you will recall the day back in March of 1981 when President Ronald Reagan was gunned down by the assassin John Hinckley. Reagan almost died that day, but he recovered from that tragic event. And his daughter, Patty Davis, related the events that led what she believed to Reagan's healing. She said there was one essential element that was responsible for her dad, President Reagan's, physical healing. Patty wrote, my father said he knew that his physical healing was directly, was directly dependent on his ability to forgive John Hinckley. Forgiveness is hard work, but my father made it sound effortless, Patty wrote. Many times, she said, I'd listen to my father tell me that we are all God's children. Maybe at one time I chalked it up to the language of a church-going man. But when he referred to John Hinckley's misguided, as misguided, I felt the weight of that word. The weight of what it said about my father. He never expressed hatred for the man who shot him. He expressed pity. He knew in his world that even John Hinckley belonged to God. That knowledge, Patty says, leads to forgiveness. It transforms and it heals. I thought about, as I read this past week, of a person that is going to be interviewed on CBS tonight, I believe it is, uh, an interview of one of the most prolific serial killers of all time here in America that has just confessed to 93 murders. And just as the carousel would go around, 
he tells about the 93 women that he murdered, people that he killed in that interview. When you think about in this world today, how much, how important forgiveness is, although the deep wounds that you and I and the memories of the past, even though those things can never be erased in our life, they can be transformed and healed through the process known as forgiveness. For the past nine weeks and today the 10th sermon and next Sunday morning the 11th and the final sermon on our series on forgiveness. I hope that in these past 11 weeks come next Sunday, I hope that you and I understand what God means about forgiveness through his word. We've talked about what forgiveness is. We've talked about what forgiveness isn't. And in these past sermons, I believe they have served as just a prelude for what we're going to discuss today. You see, if you and I are going to discover today how to grant the gift of forgiveness to other people, and in the process of granting forgiveness, which is a wonderful gift, we receive the healing from the pains and from the wounds and from the memories of the past. There's no story perhaps in all of human history that better illustrates the process of granting forgiveness than the story of Joseph and his brothers in the Old Testament. His story begins in the book of Genesis in chapter 37. Let me just give you sort of a brief synopsis of Joseph's life. You will remember that Joseph was one of Jacob's 12 sons. He was, in fact, the favorite son of his father, as evidenced by the multicolored coat that he paraded before his brothers. His father had bestowed that upon him. And Joseph's brothers absolutely hated him with a passion. They hated him because he was the favorite son. Uh, there, there's another sermon there. And I, I, I don't want to wade off into that today. But parents, be careful about having the favored child. Joseph's brother hated him because he was the favored child. And they looked for a chance to get even with their brother, and that chance came one day. In fact, Jacob asked uh, Joseph to go out into the field and to take some food out to his brothers. And um, as he went out there by himself and the brothers saw him coming, they thought to themselves, wow, here's our chance to get rid of this Joseph guy. At first they decided they would kill him, but then they compromised and they decided they would just leave him out there in a pit in Genesis chapter 37, verse 24. And they would allow him to be sold into slavery. Then they took that multicolored coat that his father had given him and they dipped it in animal's blood and they took it back home and they said to their father Jacob that Joseph is no more. He's been killed by an animal. And the Bible says that Jacob mourned the loss of his son for many days. Joseph had been forsaken by his brothers but let me tell you, he had not been forgotten by God. God knew where Joseph was. And through a series of miraculous circumstances, God raised up Joseph out of that pit of despair and he put him into a position of prominence to be the right-hand man to the Pharaoh of all of Egypt. And once Joseph received that position, God sent Pharaoh some dreams and in a series of dreams Joseph was able to interpret what those dreams meant. God said to Pharaoh there's going to be seven years of plentiful harvest in the land of Egypt and it's going to be followed by seven years of famine. And so Joseph advised the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he said it'd be wise for us to take a portion of the harvest from these first seven years and put it away for the seven years of famine that is to follow. 
And Pharaoh agreed with Joseph on that. Just as God predicted there were seven years of plentiful harvest followed by the seven years of famine. And that famine would not only affect the land of Egypt, but it would affect the whole region of that world, including Canaan, which is now Israel, where Jacob and the 11 other sons lived. When Jacob heard the news that there was plenty of food down there in Egypt that you could go buy, he sends his other 11 sons to Egypt to make a plea for this grain. Little did those brothers realize that on that particular day that they would be making their request to none other than the brother that they had long ago put into a pit, sold into slavery. 22 years earlier, and we find this morning the story of that confrontation that took place in the book of Genesis, chapter 45, verses 1 through 4. Follow along, please. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And Joseph cried, Have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And Joseph wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the scene on that particular day standing in front of the brother they got rid of and he confronts them and lets them know that he is Joseph and the brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me and they came closer and then notice in verses 4 and 5, Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come closer to me. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. God sent me before you, verse 7, to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Verse 8, now therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Let me tell you what Joseph was doing at this particular moment. What jo Joseph was doing at this moment, his focus was not on what the brothers had done to him in the past, but his focus was on the God of sovereignty that knew what he was doing. Verse 9 says, Joseph says, hurry up, hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt, come down to me, do not delay. Verse 10, you shall live in the land of Goshen. Young people, Goshen was the most fertile of all the land of Egypt. And notice, notice he's repaying good for the evil done him. You shall live in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. Jacob and the brothers accepted Joseph's invitation and they came to, to Goshen, that incredible fertile land. And for the next 17 years, they enjoyed an incredible reunion together. And then at the end of those 17 years, old father Jacob died at age 147. And then those brothers began to wander to themselves. Was Joseph just putting on a charade for us? Or did he really, did he really mean what he said? Now that our father is gone, the test is in the pudding. And so they came to Joseph. Look in verse 18 through 21 of chapter 50. 
Then his brothers also came and fell down before Joseph and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So Joseph comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Now if you're a student of Scripture, you know that more time is spent on the life of Joseph than on the life of Abraham, who was the father of the nation of Israel, more than any time spent on Isaac, more than any time spent on Jacob, and more than any other major character in all of the Old Testament. Why did God spend so much ink in Scripture on Joseph? Why did God spend all of those chapters telling this particular story? I believe it's because Joseph illustrates the most important decision that a person can make in his or her life, and that's the decision to forgive. That decision has vast ramifications. I want you to think with me this morning. Just think for just a moment. What if you had been Joseph? What if, what if Joseph, what if Joseph had decided, I'm not going to give my, forgive my brothers. I remember that stinky, smelly pit that they stuck me down in of. Here they come to me and they want food. Food? Why would I want to give you food? You stuck me in a pit and, and you walked off and you left me to die there. Food, no food for you today. What if Joseph had not forgiven his brothers? What would have happened? What would have happened if Joseph had just said, forget it. You're on your own. Figure it out for yourself. You should have thought about that 22 years ago. Let me tell you, if Joseph had not forgiven, there would have been no food. For their children and there would have been no nation of Israel those brothers were the progenitor the progenitors of the, the whole nation of Israel if Joseph would not have forgiven there would have been no brothers and there would have been no Israel and if there had been no Israel there would have been no Lord Jesus Christ and had there been no Lord Jesus Christ, there would not have been a savior of the world where you and I would be left to suffer the consequences of our sins. Joseph's decision to forgive not only affected his life, but it affected all of the lives of everyone else. And it affected, it would have affected my life. It would have affected your life. If Joseph would not have forgiven, those brothers and left them out there to die and to starve to death there would be no nation of Israel there would have been no Jesus coming through the lineage of the Jewish people you and I would have not had the holy writ of scripture that we have and you and I would have been left in our sins to suffer the consequences of those till the day we died but let me tell you, Joseph's story, it inspires us. Joseph's story here instructs us on how we are to forgive. If you're taking notes in your outline there in the bulletin, I want to give you seven principles today in closing. Number one, true forgiveness admits that someone has wronged you. True forgiveness admits before you can forgive somebody, you've got to first identify who you are forgiving and what you are forgiving. You've got to admit there has been some type of injustice done to me. Second principle this morning, 
True forgiveness acknowledges that a debt exists. Wrongs that we do to others create an obligation. For example, a, a traffic violation results generally in a fine, if not a warning. A guilty verdict, as we read about a few moments ago on the police officer in Dallas who wrongly shot inadvertently, accidentally, sadly, a person thought to be an intruder. A guilty verdict results in a sentence. And by the way, she was sentenced to 10 years in prison for that. Negligence results in a, a lawsuit. Joseph not only admitted that his brothers wronged him, but they owed him for what they had done. When Joseph said in Genesis 50 verse 19, when Joseph looked at his 11 brothers and said, do not be afraid, you know what he's implying there? He's implying they had every reason to be afraid in addition to identifying exactly what the person has done to you. I encourage you and me to calculate the debt that we owe for the wrongs we have done to other people. To calculate the wrongs that we owe to God for our sins. Let me tell you, what about calculating the debt that, that you owe in a relationship because of an affair? The other spouse says, I should divorce you. Or because of your negligence, I should sue you. Or because of your actions, I should have you prosecuted. Just remember that our offenses always create obligations. A third principle we can learn from Joseph today is that true forgiveness releases our offender of his or her obligation. The word, remember the word forgive means to release another person of the hurt that they've done against you. Notice Joseph did that. Instead of giving his brothers the death sentence, which he could have done, they deserved punishment for what they had done. What did Joseph do? He released them from the debt by giving them a new land to live in where there would be plenty of food for them, his father, their children, and their grandchildren. You see, God helped me to forgive. Lord, help me to let go. There should come a time when you and I say to God and to ourselves, today I'm going to let go of my past hurts. Folks, I'll tell you what, there are more people today who are physically sick because they have carried with them grudges, hatred, anger, bitterness. And I want you to know, I believe that in the the, these 11 weeks of our studies of forgiveness. I believe that God is saying, I believe that's why so much ink was given to Joseph in the Old Testament. Because God wanted to illustrate to you and to me the importance of forgiveness in the pastoral prayers for the past 10 weeks. We have said the model prayer. Forgive us our we used to say debts as we forgive our debtors. Or we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. There comes a time when you've got to let go of the hurt that you have. Now we said to forgive, to forgive, we are supposed to do that. Jesus said, that we are supposed to give. You can do that anytime, anywhere. All you have to do is pray to Jesus. If, you, if you've got all against your brother, if your brother's got all against you, the Bible says before you, if you're coming to the temple, leave your altar. Get up and go make it right with your brother. And then come back and come to the altar with your offerings. But let me tell you, forgiveness is a spiritual function we are to forgive Ephesians 4 32 to forgive as God in Christ has forgiven us but to forget 
That is a biological function. You know why? Because we said because of the electrical impulses in our brain, because of the chemical transferences in our brain, our biological chemistry will not allow us to forget because everything, over a trillion things, are seared into our brain and they are there permanently. We may not always be able to recall them, but those are there. To forgive is a spiritual function. Jesus said forgive. Forgetting is a biological function that you and I really have no control over. And so this idea of forgiveness, there must come a time where you've got to let go of the past. More people this morning are living in the past than are ever living in the present. And their lives are not filled with the joy of the Lord because of that. You see, true forgiveness that Joseph illustrates releases our offender of the obligation that we could exact. But we know that vengeance is the Lord's, not ours. We can pray for justice. We can hope for justice. But vengeance belongs to the Lord. Principle number four, true forgiveness waits for the right time to confront our offender. On the cross, get the picture, 2,000 years ago, on Golgotha's hill, Jesus with outstretched arms and two thieves one on either side. And Jesus looked down at those Roman soldiers. And what did he do? Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. If there's one thing I hope we all remember from the series on forgiveness is that forgiveness is a unilateral choice that we intentionally make. It's something we do regardless of whether the other person deserves to be forgiven or asked to be forgiven and remorse for what they have done. Can you only imagine what Joseph could have thought? For 22 years, for all those years, no reunion, regrets, the song says regrets. I've had a few and then again too few to mention. Let me tell you, regrets, reunion, remorse. Think of all the time that that family lost with Joseph and Joseph lost with that family. Let me tell you, we can forgive regardless of what the other person does. Forgiveness only depends upon you. Reconciliation, as we learn, depends upon a number of things. Joseph desired to not only be with his family, but he wanted to be reconciled with them. How would he know if they were genuinely sorry for what they'd done? In Genesis 44, it's one of the strangest passages in all the Bible. In fact, Martin Luther said he argued that it shouldn't even be in the Bible. I'm not sure that Martin Luther understood what was going on here because it was critical and crucial to the story of Joseph. Genesis chapter 44 is before Genesis chapter 45 when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. But in chapter 44, before he reveals himself, the brothers, they came and they asked for food and so they could go back to the land of Canaan. And Joseph says, well, okay, let's just have a big party. L let me throw a big feast in your honor. What they didn't know that was going to happen here was that Joseph was going to use a covert operation called a frame and blame game. He wanted to see, have my brothers learned anything all these years? Have they learned anything about what they've done? Notice in Genesis 44, 1 through 4, and verse 16. 
Then he commanded his house steward. Then Joseph commanded his house steward, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest. That was Benjamin. And his money for the grain. And he did as Joseph had told him. As soon as it was light, the men were sent away. They with their donkeys. They had just gone out of the city and were not far. When Joseph said to his house steward, Up, follow the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Verse 16. So Judah. Judah said, What can we say to my Lord? What can we speak? And how can we justify ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's slaves, both we and the one in whose possession the cup has been found. Let me tell you, they were not being punished for something here they had done. Joseph concocted this situation with his steward and said, plant my cup in this sack. And let them go on their way. Let me tell you, they were not being punished for this event. They were being punished for what had happened 22 years prior to this event with Joseph. Joseph knew they're they're not guilty of stealing the cup, but he wanted to hear what they were guilty of. And this is the first time Joseph senses that there's any repentance in his brother's hearts. Even now, he wasn't sure. Were they just sorry they had been caught with the cup? Or were they really sorry for what they had done for Joseph 22 years ago? And so he presses the issue further. He says, I realize you're not all guilty, so I'm not going to make you all stay here as hostages. So what I want you to do is leave your youngest brother here with me down in Egypt. That would be Benjamin. And the rest of you can go home. Look at verse 33 and 34. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord and let the lad go up with his brothers. Verse 34. For how shall I go up? Judah is speaking. Judah says, For how shall I go up to my father if the lad, Benjamin, is not with me for fear that I see the evil that would overtake my father? Judah stands and he makes a plea to Joseph. It's probably one of the most impressive pleas in all of the Bible. Judah was saying to Joseph, please let the lad stay. I'll trade my life for his. It would kill my father to see Benjamin remain here in Egypt. And at that particular moment, Joseph knew that the repentance was sincere. Why? Because it was Judah who was the spokesman for the 12 brothers. It was Judah who got Joseph sold into slavery. He's the one that led the group to leave him in the pit. Now 22 years later, he's standing before his brother Joseph. And at that particular moment, Joseph knows the true Repentance has come into the heart of his brothers. You see, this principle is illustrating this. You can forgive someone immediately and instantly, but the only time you ever verbalize to the other person is when you sense they're ready to receive your forgiveness and to be reconciled. Principle number five, true forgiveness resists unnecessary embarrassment. Before Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, you know what he did? He made them clear the room. And he wept so loudly. The Bible says all of the Egyptians that were around there heard it. True forgiveness. True forgiveness does not try to embarrass. Number six. True forgiveness relieves people of unhealthy Sorrow. If you've truly forgiven somebody, you want to relieve them of the sorrow they feel. This isn't as much fun because we love to watch people on the judgment seat rather than on the mercy seat. Chuck Swindoll said we would much rather sit on a judgment seat than on a mercy seat. 
If somebody hurts us, we would much rather see them squirm in misery than smile in relief. You see, in that just the way we are? Notice Genesis 45, verse 5. Now do not be grieved, Joseph said, or angry with yourselves because, notice he points it out, you sold me here for God, for God. The sovereign God who controls things from heaven. The one who sits at the helm of the ship in heaven this morning, the God of heaven who sits and controls the affairs of men upon this earth, whether they know it or whether they don't. It sifts through his hands first before he ever allows it to happen. Sovereignty was at work. And Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. No wonder we would see Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Principle number Seven, and I'm through. True forgiveness. True forgiveness continually, continually releases our offender of his or her obligation. Jesus said, forgive. How many times? Seventy times seven. That means an unlimited amount of time. And Joseph had to do that. Joseph had to do that. This morning... <clears throat> I think beyond Joseph's theological motivation for forgiveness, I think there was a, releasing, a, a reason to release. Joseph had carried it far too long. There's some of you out here today. There are people that are listening today by radio. You've lived in solitary confinement through the years of bitterness, through the years of estrangement. And it's really taken its toll on your life. Aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of carrying the bitterness and the anger of the past? You see, Joseph wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it. Joseph wanted the relief from all that he had carried through those years of what his brothers had done to him. If any of you ever saw the movie The Help, in one of those scenes, Emma Stone plays that part. A black woman and she looks at the white woman who had treated her so terribly. She says, Miss Hilly, aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of living the way you're living? I can tell you this world is rocking, it's reeling, it's teetering, it's tottering this morning because people are carrying angst and bitterness, hostility, aggression all through life and they cannot release it and let it go. This morning, Joseph illustrates for you and for me what granting forgiveness truly and genuinely means. If you want to be better in life, let it go. If you want to continue to be angry and bitter, live in your solitary confinement with all of that, and it will take its toll on your life. Would you stand as we pray together?